Hello, Dominique. Welcome to the Make Life Rich Movement podcast. Good morning. Happy to be here. I am very excited to talk to you today. Everyone, I'm just going to give you a little brief breakdown of my stalking over the years of Dominique. I am so in love with your aesthetic, your overall personal branding, and uh, the way in which you make the everyday life just look so beautiful and sumptuous to me is like your superpower. You definitely turn everything up several notches, but just looks so effortless. So I'm really excited to talk to you today and just um, hear kind of all of how all of this came together for you and your, your career as a content creator. Yeah, absolutely. I'm pumped. Yay. Okay. So I know that you have a nine to five. So guys, this whole conversation is based with someone that has a nine to five. You're married. You guys travel a lot. They, she has a lot going on in her life, and she has a very successful and prolific content creation career. So I am super hyped to hear how you balance it all and make it all work. But can you tell us a little bit about maybe like your first thoughts of wanting to get into content creation and like dipping your toe in the pool? What what was that like for you? What What things mentally did you have to kind of mm -hmm. get in line before you're like, all right, I'm in the game. I'm doing this. Yeah, totally. I will preface by saying I am a Capricorn through and through. I have six <gasps> planets in Capricorn. So I am always looking for more work to do and more projects for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've always been kind of into social media. I had a Tumblr account back in the 2010s that had like 10,000 followers. And that was less of creating your own content, more of curating, right? Like I just wanted to create this beautiful page with very ethereal things on there, but I wasn't necessarily creating my own stuff. And um, when COVID hit, I, right before COVID hit, I had decided I wanted to get a nose job because I had wanted one for like my entire life. And my husband was like, you should look into it. You should look into it. And I had kind of just thought it's never going to happen. It's so expensive. But I ended up meeting a surgeon that I really loved and ended up getting a rhinoplasty during COVID. And prior to that, I had just started creating content. And for me, I was just like, you know, I, I, I love doing this with Tumblr back in the day. And I really want free stuff. I would watch all those YouTube videos um, like Tati on YouTube. It was like opening all my PR packages. And I was just like, wow, it'd be so cool to get free stuff. Not really realizing all that goes into the expectation behind getting PR. Mm -hmm. And so I had made a couple connections here and there with people. And that was something I really wasn't expecting was the community that I created. Um, and so once I got the rhinoplasty, I felt just so much more confident. And I shared that entire process as well. I have a highlight on my page that's a little bloody and goes into detail on all, what that entailed. Um, but I, I felt so much more confident. And slowly I went from just taking pictures in my apartment to outside my apartment to parking garages to other spaces. And then out of the blue one day, I got a request to do a paid campaign which wasn't even something I had thought about because I think I had about four or 5,000 followers at the time. And that's kind of my progression. I'm going to be 30 next year. So I've been on the internet for a long time and things just kind of moved from, I think I want to do this. Now I feel more confident to do this. Now I have friends who do this and now I do this and I actually make money from it, which is awesome. Very blessed. I always have these moments within conversations with people I kind of just uh, like pick people that I'm fascinated by and want to be like friends with to interview. And typically there comes a moment where I recognize based on what they just said, the fact that they're living their childhood dream as an adult and making money from it and finding joy from it. And you just connected those dots for me. So this is something you've been doing since 2010, which I'm assuming then you were at least a teen, you were young. So when you're going to be 30. Yeah. So you're definitely young. Six, yeah. 16 then. So we'll, we'll call that your childhood dream. And yep. for you to now be doing it in a manner that's on your terms, you've crafted amazing partnerships with people. Um, you've been able to establish boundaries for yourself, which was one of the biggest reasons why I was happy to have you on just to, and we'll get into that, but you really have crafted a place where you can be creative. You're getting to work with brands you love that now love you. It's like, it's so beautiful to see that that's come full circle and we knocked it out in the first four minutes. So that's love <laughs> that's it. So, so great for me. I love that too. Um, so tell me a little bit about what that first campaign 
felt like. You had to, I guess, learn very quickly, lots of Googling, lots of deciphering what they meant from the email they sent you. But how did that first campaign go for you? And, and what very quick lessons did you have to kind of put in place? Mm -hmm. It was with a jewelry brand, Manuel, that was super well known. And they were just like, we'd love for you to do a carousel post for $300. And I was like, oh, money? Instead of just product, like I was happy accepting product at that point in time. And for me, I'm a very organized person and I can't relax unless I feel like I have everything where it should be. So I remember I got a whiteboard and I like stuck it up on the wall next to my work from home desk because it was COVID and I was working from home for my full-time job. And I would write like my um, deadlines and when I had to post, I'd even put the little hashtags and stuff up there. Now I've moved into the digital age and I use Evernote for those things. But I had to learn very quickly uh, how to write invoices. That was something I had never done before, was creating invoices. Um, yeah. I created an LLC. That was a whole process and reading governmental websites as like a 29 year old teenage girl and trying to understand what the different business types was something to learn very quickly. And then also advocating for myself and asking those questions of like, with the boundary setting, like you said, okay, you're going to send me this product. No, I can't get you the content in three days. It's I'm, I, I take 14 days maximum to create that content. No, I can't accept payment within 90 days. I expect 30 to 60. And those were things that it took some time and like kind of kicking myself to understand that those were things I had to advocate for myself in that, in that space. Ah, that's beautiful. I think there is a moment for content creators where they're very eager to just get product because it's really great validation in the beginning, right? But then you find yourself in like a quagmire of being like, okay, well, I'm ready to start doing paid, but I have zero idea like what it is that I'm I'm supposed to be saying that I want for myself because they, uh, as a 14-year publicist, I can tell you a lot of brands do hold their cards really close to their chest. And unless you are in the industry or you have experience with the things that you can ask for, there's so much you can ask for, um, they're not going to give it to you. Like it's a pat on their back if they keep the budget low for the marketing efforts that, you know, they're working on for their client or the company that they're um, an employee with. So tell us a little bit about how it felt within those moments of emailing these people back and being like, oh, well, I want to work with this brand, but... Uh, I don't like these terms or they're not, mm -hmm. you know, accepting my creative direction and they want me to do something totally different that isn't in my wheelhouse. Like, tell us about a few of the occasions to where you were like, eh, no, I'm good. Or how mm -hmm. you were able to turn it around to what worked for you. I think back when I started, I didn't really read terms and conditions all that much. I didn't understand what they meant. So oftentimes I would do gifted work or even early paid work where my content was given to them in perpetuity. So that's something that I look mm -hmm. at now is that I don't feel comfortable selling my image for anything less than the right price, which is pretty high if they're going to have it forever. So mm -hmm. that was a big thing that I kind of had to get through. Um, but I get a lot of like nowadays, it's like, hey, we would love to work with you. There was a, a English jewelry brand, for example, that was so nice in their email. And I was like, I'd love to work with you. I have so much experience working with jewelry brands, both on a uh, UGC and posted influencer basis, blah, blah, blah. And they come back and they're like, awesome. We'll give you two pieces for three posts. And I'm just like, um, back in the day, I might've been like, you know, maybe I would have taken it, but now I'm more so trying to think about my time. And a lot, what a lot of these brands do is they dangle this carrot, right? where they're like, hey, we would just love to test out a partnership and see how it goes the first time. And then after that, there's the opportunity for paid collabs. And if there's anything I've learned, it's that uh, people believe that past performance, past like history of how you've done is not proof of how things are gonna go in the future, which is kind of a narcissistic, uh, pessimistic way to look at things, but it's true. Right. And so what I ended up saying to these brands was like, I can't pay my bills with the idea of us maybe working together in the future because what these brands do is they take your free content and they just move on to the next content creator there are that hundreds of thousands of us hundreds of thousands of people who want to be creators who are happy to do the work for free so i hope to have other people know like don't give away your work for free especially don't do it in exchange for the promise of paid work down the line because if you don't value my work now you're not going to value it later and i do think that when you have um a resume of work you've done it should speak to what you're going to create and you deserve to be paid for that 
Exactly. I'm so happy that you came to that condition and uh, circumstance early on to where it felt gross. And you're like, no, because it has skyrocketed you to having, it's like you told the universe, no, for these things that weren't aligning. And then here comes, I want to get into Selkie so bad because like everyone knows. Everyone yes, knows, we can. Right? But we're going to save oh. for that question for a little bit for now because I need all the details. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would love to know what collateral did you have to make for yourself to be able to uh, present to these brands, whether you're pitching them cold turkey or, you know, they mm -hmm. want to work with you. They want to see what you've got. Um, tell us a little bit about the tools and the collateral that you have um, and that you would suggest someone looking to get into this career make for themselves. First things first, get on every single influencer marketing platform that's out there just to see what there is because you never know. A lot of brands use multiple at the same time. So that's an easy way. Uh, the harder thing to do is to make a media kit, which I did on Canva, which I try to keep updated as I send things out to brands. I'll be honest because I have a full-time job. I don't do a lot of pitching unless I've already had something that's done really well. So for example, I had two videos on TikTok um, that featured a house of CB dress that did really, really well. And so I reached out to them, sent them my media kit, and they gave me the, we'll get back to you. So I'm assuming nothing will come from that. So I try not to put too much energy into pitching because I do have a full-time job that I'm not necessarily relying on my social media income. It's beautiful to have, but it's it's not my be-all end-all at the end of the day. Um, I use... Evernote to keep everything organized. I've started working with Lemonade lately, which is like ByteDance's new app. It's kind of like Instagram and Pinterest had a baby. And I'm making 30 posts for them a month and I have to create them, get them approved, post them, share links. What's so a lot to kind of keep track of. And then of course, payment tracking. So yeah. having a digital platform to do that is really helpful. Um, so apart from platforms, media kit, organization, I'd say if you're based in the US, setting yourself up as an actual business. I set myself up as an LLC, which made a huge difference for my tax income last year, which is also a huge learning curve for creators. My biggest tip is to take 30% out right away and put it in a bank account because I didn't do that last year and now we're paying a big bill. But that would probably be all of them just to set yourself up properly for the future. Even if you're not making a huge income, being able to track those things and see how much time you're spending because time is money. Perfect tips. And the tax one is huge. Also, uh, I would recommend if you don't have a lawyer you're working with, work with one that knows a content creator's life. There's so many things that are able to be written off in a non-shady manner. Um, you just have to work with a professional that knows your job and knows what goes into it, what equipment and things you're usually required to have. So, I would love to hear just a teeny bit about what you're including in your media kit. I've made thousands in my career. I love them. I think every person that is building a brand, whether or not they want to do anything with it, should have one ready, even if just to be used as a TV expert for something in a news clip, or you never know what you could need it for. But I would love to hear what you include in your media kit. Yeah, absolutely. I have like a little blurb about me, but I almost feel like a media kit's very similar to a resume. And I read resumes in my full-time tech job and I'm going through it in 10 seconds. So I don't put too much work into the actual text on it in terms of the sentences. I include my Instagram and TikTok followings, engagement rate. And then typically it's been my last 90 days of impressions, either on Instagram or TikTok. The Instagram algorithm has not been doing me so sweet recently. So I've kind of switched it over to TikTok because that's where I'm seeing a lot more um, views and, and engagement coming in. And I feel like it's best to put the information that's going to give you a leg up on there and highlight that versus highlighting, you know, I used to get this many views on Instagram and it's not like that anymore. And the rest of it is um, photos. And I have a couple of links on there for video examples. Since we've introduced video, media, media kits have been a little harder to create because you can't necessarily put a video on a PDF. Um, yeah. So I have it as kind of an amalgamation of different uh, images I've created with the name of the brand on there as well. And then some links to some videos as well too. Short and sweet. I love that. It definitely gives, as you said, the person going through many of them, the ability to get right to the meat and potatoes of it. And I think uh, I'd love to pull out the tip for the listeners about you alternating 
what social media you are highlighting the statistics of based on what's doing best. It sounds like mm-hmm. something very simple, but it's absolutely something that I see a lot of people overlook changing. Just because you did well one month, you know, it's very much a game that's in the moment. They need to see what you're doing. And there's no shame in having to switch the focus of what platform you're primarily using. Just go with the algorithm. And if you're having uh, difficulty deciding what to do about what, you can always make two versions of the media kit. Have one for Instagram, one for TikTok. In case they are two totally different ways you're presenting your brand, which I've seen a lot of people do. Could you tell us a little bit about what it felt like to be kind of scheduling out all of these projects around your full-time life? Because most people starting a content creator business are also going to have a nine to five. So what were those early days like of just being able to make sure you had the bandwidth emotionally and physically to do this increase of work? I was really lucky because I was working at home at the time full time. So um, I had also, I think back then, I was in a position at my current company where I was an individual contributor. And so I didn't have a ton of time. So given that it was in COVID, my husband was working at home as well. A lot of the time we would typically spend just quality time was all the time. So it was a great excuse to just get the heck out of the house and go find a place to take some pictures. And looking back now, I wish that I had been more confident because COVID meant nobody was out and about and I could have gotten so many more cool shots without people being around back then. But I I started off just every Sunday. Sundays were the days my husband worked and I would get up and put on one outfit and go shoot at the same location every single Sunday. And that was what I did on a Sunday. And then as it got further out, I really had to keep myself um, held to some of those standards with brands that were like, no, I take 14 days because I need the time because I work a full-time job. And usually they're okay with that. I also started to charge a rush fee if they wanted something quicker because then I'd have to move other things around, which most brands were like, no, we don't want to pay that. We can wait, which helps them kind of figure that out. Nowadays, Sundays are still my day. Uh, I've switched teams at work to, I'm not so much of an individual contributor anymore. So I have other team members that I can lean on, which makes it a lot less stressful and I can be a lot more flexible. Uh, I only work from home two days a week now, and I spend a lot of time creating TikTok advertisements that I don't post, that get posted on brands' pages. So I do those on Mondays and Fridays. Sundays are usually the day that I still go make content out and about, but usually with a friend at the same time, which is one of my favorite things, has been meeting people and having those uh, relationships that blossom. Like I actually have a lemonade post going up this week titled, I met my best friend on Instagram, which is completely true. So things have just changed a little bit, but I think that I um, have been able to, you know, my job always comes first, my day job, a hundred percent. Like if I'm stressed and I have to say no to something, it's going to be social media because at the end of the day, my company pays my bills and they have me, I'm salaried. So more than 40 hours a week, but 40 hours a week. And so you have to really set in your mind those priorities and what's important to you. And so on Friday last week, my husband wasn't, uh, he had the day off for some reason, an extra day off. And that was the day I was going to film like four UGC videos. And I was like, you know what? No, we, we're going to go have a nice day, like a little date day together. And I'll push this to Sunday instead. So being able to make those decisions, I think is, and be a little less rigid is really important. Very. And it's a really great uh, way to avoid burnout on both ends of the spectrum for you, right? And it still keeps it fun rather than something with a deadline that you must do. Uh, I love that you give the 14-day parameter. If you're uh, over time, the more you are creating content, is it, it just comes out. Once you know yourself, yeah. you're comfortable in front of the camera, then that gives you the room to get really creative and to try different things. So can you tell us a little bit about what your creativity curve has been like as you've gotten more comfortable um, creating the content. And are you, are you just putting up um, like you're by yourself shooting and you're just using like Mm -hmm. a control. Awesome. I would love to learn about that process as well. Yeah, totally. Um, So I started off, like if I go back in my archived posts on Instagram, I would just take a picture of my office, my office outfit in the bathroom mirror. And I put this terrible filter over it. It's just like, I look back and I'm like, girl, what were you doing? But we had to start there to get here. And uh, I've always been a fan of 
the X posting on Instagram, which means you do a picture of you and then a filler picture, then a picture of you and then a filler picture. And it ends up lining up in that. All the pictures of you line up in an X and the fillers are in there. So I've stuck, that's the one thing I've really stuck with over the last three years. That's kind of for me, really helped me structure and what I need. And from there, once I started like leaving my apartment, I would go to this one parking lot in Austin that had a black wall. It was a brick wall painted black and I would take all my pictures there, all of them. And then I started to pull in some little filler pictures I had taken from trips and whatnot. And once I was like, okay, I got to do something else. I started to find other places that I would go. And it's, it's always just me and my tripod. I actually hate having my photo taken by other people very control freak in that way. Like people will reach out and be like, I own a studio in Austin. I'd love to do some free photography. And I'm like, no, thanks. I'm good. I just, I like to have the control over what that looks like. And I actually still, when I use my iPhone, I still shoot with the front camera, which is less quality, but I just, I need to be able to see what's going on yes. to make it work for me. Um, and now I have no shame. Like I will go downtown middle of Austin, middle of a Saturday where there's a ton of people and pull up my tripod and take photos. And if someone wants to make a comment, I'll make it right back. I remember I was here in a shopping center in Austin with a friend taking some pictures and this woman and her husband stared at us their entirety of their meal from the patio they were on. And we were done. I walked over and I was like, did you guys enjoy the show? And they were so uncomfortable. And I was like, good, because if you're going to stare at people nonstop, like I'm getting paid to do this. It's not embarrassing. I don't think it's that embarrassing. Uh, and at this point, I'm like, whatever I got to do to get it done, I'll do. Amen. I think the largest barrier that I hear, I get asked often how people can start reaching out to brands. I want to I wanna be a creator. I'm like, okay, cool. How comfortable are you in front of a camera? Because people think it'll just be like, oh, it's okay. I'll just like stand there. No, this is an art form. And it's a, I would almost say a mental health exercise to get comfortable enough to let your guard down, feel relaxed, and then feel relaxed enough to become confident, which then leaves, leads you to be more creative and doing like things you wouldn't normally do that can make you laugh and feel a little silly. But at the end of the day, this is your art. This is your medium. And I, uh, it's interesting how little people think about that they need to get comfortable in camera first. If you could give anyone a tip about how they could go about getting more comfortable in photos that they're taking of themselves, because we'll assume everyone is going to take it by themselves, especially if they're a little nervous about like getting in front of somebody else's camera, what would be like your number one tip for them? Just finding their angles, figuring out what they like to see themselves look like on the other end. I would say practice makes perfect, but th there's a limit to that at the same point. I will go out and set, let's say, I can, there's way, I can get a shoot done in 20 minutes these days and then move on to another location and do another thing. But if it's your first time and you're not really sure, just keep taking the photos, keep taking them. There, I have a, um, There's a feature on iPhone called voice control and I have it set it up. So every time I say a certain word, it will tap the screen and take the photo for me. So find those tools that help you because you can't always use a clicker. They don't always work. It can be a little stressful, but just keep going. And there's sometimes I'll finish a shoot and I'll say to my friend, if I didn't get the shot, I'm deformed because I took so many photos. There's one in there. There's one in there somewhere, but there's a limit to that. I have a friend who is so beautiful and so creative, but she's very hard on herself. And she shot the same outfit three days in a row in the same location because she didn't get it perfect. She doesn't have a job, full-time job, so she can do that. But for me, I have a full-time job. I don't have time. I'm not going to go and put the same outfit on and shoot it again unless the brand asks me to or there's a serious reason why. So getting comfortable with, you know, we're not, I'm not Kendall Jenner. I'm not Claudia Schiffer. My actual supermodel audience will get that one. And what people want to see is a real person. So making sure to stay authentic to yourself and just doing it over and over and over and over again. You'll figure out, like, once I got my nose done, I love profile side shots. Whereas before, not something I was interested in. And just keep trying new things. And there's going to be photos where you just look absolutely ridiculous and we just delete them, right? You favorite the ones that are great and you just delete them and you keep going. And I do actually, I think you're on my close friends. If not, I'll have to add you. 
I'll share things where I'm like my eye, half my eye is closed and I look totally <laughs> ridiculous. And I'm like, got the shot guys. This is the <laughs> one. And people do like to see that stuff because it's the reality behind the beautiful, mm. perfect photo. Mm-hmm. In a, I would love to be added to your close friends. I don't think I am, but I would love to see bloopers. Uh, Bloopers to me were like the most fun part about shoots. Uh, I kind of threw myself into at least forcing myself to go take a photo a day. When I lived in Philadelphia, I'd be like meeting up with another girlfriend that liked to make content and we would just like go at it. And then I'd get back to the house and we were just like spewing photos. There's people everywhere, man, the, humility that comes from being able to laugh at yourself, I think makes made the transition for me feel a little easier to where it's like, okay, like, yeah, that dude made a nasty comment when he walked by, but like, look at my face afterwards because I took what he said seriously. Like yep. no one should affect your day in that way. And if they're feeling triggered enough to call attention to what you're doing, nine times out of 10, it's because they are upset with themselves for not even having a shrivel of the confidence and like the creativity that you have to even want to go and try and do this thing. So you have to really just know it's not about you. It's always about them. And you know, you might want to feel a little bad for them because they don't want their picture taken, which means they don't think very highly of themselves. And that's sad. So that did help me because there were a lot of hecklers. It was, it's Philadelphia. So they're a tough crowd to begin with, but (laughs) I think another piece of it too is just like um, huge influencers, right? Like they do reach a level of not being able to relate to their audiences. And so I think if you can look at what you don't want to be versus what you do want to be, that's a big thing, right? I remember seeing a post on Reddit that was like, I saw this girl at the ice cream store and she was an influencer and she took a picture of her photo and threw her ice cream and threw it in the trash. Who cares? She's not affecting anybody. I don't care if someone looks at me like that. I spent my money on it, whatever. What I do care about is I don't want to be in people's way. I don't want to impact someone's day. So if I'm vacationing somewhere and there's a line to take a photo in front of a thing, which isn't really my thing, but You know, people do that like in Nashville, right? They've got those big angel wings you can go take a photo of. I'm not going to spend 45 minutes and impact other people. So those are kind of my check boxes. Am I impacting other people in a negative way? Am I going to have to irritate somebody to get this photo in a way that actually matters? If the answer is no to both of those, I'm going to keep doing my thing. And if you want to record me, if you want to laugh at me, if that's totally cool with me, I'm kind of in my own world. Yes. Yes. And that's the best place to be when you're in your creative flow state. Just stay in tune with what you're working on and what, and what your goal is and why you're, why you're there in the first place. Just be in your own lane. Okay. We have to talk about Selkie. I'm wondering if this is your largest, happiest, like, was this your like pie in the sky dream, um, partnership? If not, I can't wait to hear who is above that, but tell us about Selkie. And if they're not your pie in the sky, no offense to them, you could have like a dream that you're still mm-hmm. working towards. I would love to hear about that too. So they were when it happened and we don't work together anymore. We can kind of dive into that a little bit, but, oh, um, yeah. at the time I had just really discovered their brand. I thought it was so cute. And I've always loved the very like feminine, ultra feminine princess kind of style, because having a lot of tattoos, it's just a juxtaposition that you don't often see. Um, And I had a friend who had bought some stuff from them. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to email them. Why not? And I just knew that even if it wasn't a paid program, people loved their dresses, they were expensive. So there was a lot of opportunity there in terms of commission from an affiliate program. And I got accepted, which was great. They sent me a dress. It was amazing. And I ended up meeting a community of other people who love them. Selkie had at the time, like a cult, like following people just love their stuff. Cause it was a small woman owned business at the time. Not so much anymore. Um, good, good quality. They were great about taking feedback and whatnot. And so I had met some other people who let me borrow dresses of theirs. I rented some when I went to Europe so I could take them with me and take pictures. And I made over a hundred thousand dollars in sales for Selkie in like nine months. Wow. And I was constantly sharing my code. There was a time when um, a bunch of the girls from One Tree Hill did a big reunion tour and they wore Selkie dresses, but they didn't tag them. And there were like thousands of people in um, 
Sophia Bush's comments, like, where's this dress from? Where's this dress from? And I went through and I messaged every single one of them. And I was like, hey, that dress you were looking for? Because no one was answering them. I was like, it's Selkie. I have some posts on my page. I also work with them. I have a code, blah, blah, blah. And I was, I'm introducing people to the brand. I'm helping them with sizing, that type of thing. And then out of the blue one day, and this is after I've made over $100,000 in sales for them. I went, I got invited to their fashion show, fashion week. I went, it was amazing. Um, I got an email from them that was like, we have received some uh, screenshots about your brand representation and we can't work with you anymore. And I was just like, what are you talking about? Like I made so many sales for the brand. I was in a Facebook group that supported the brand. And I think what it came down to was I wasn't critical of them necessarily in a private Facebook group, but essentially they had a sample sale and they had told people, you know, we're not going to restock after this, but they didn't put limits. So the first girls who got there got like 10, 15 bags of stuff each. And then the other people who'd been in line for five hours left and then found out later that they had actually restocked. And I had commented, you know, there was some contention about that. And I essentially said, you know, I think people are upset that Selkie didn't stand their ground on these things. And as a customer, I'd be frustrated too. Or like someone would say, I ordered this item, but I got some other customer's item and it happened a bunch. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. In my comments, my only guess is that they don't appreciate any sort of criticism from their brand, regardless of the fact that I'm promoting it and selling it. So needless to say, we don't work together anymore. I don't share. I've sold all of my Selkie stuff, which was, it was heartbreaking for me, but it was a huge lesson in Mm -hmm understanding how brands operate and if it is your little cash cow like selkie was for me you can't say anything about them but at the same time like that's why people trusted the recommendations that i was making so yeah it was a lear- it was a lesson learned i'm glad that it happened and on to the next beautiful i want to pull out a few things from a publicist point of view just to kind of uh nail down a little bit of what i'm going to assume happened Um, so when you are representing a brand and that's in any capacity, whether they're giving you an affiliate code, you're a full blown, like UGC for them, or, you know, they've asked you for a certain amount of content back and forth. They, they meaning the marketers and primarily the publicists are the ones that are going to be doing some type of damage control. Now, it probably came down to two things, I'll imagine. One, they don't have enough team members to be able to go in and manage these kinds of Facebook groups. I would expect very much so that you need someone to be on Reddit. You need someone to be monitoring any kind of private face groups about the brand because yeah. this is where you hear the true feedback of the customer. And for a brand to ignore that or for it to be too difficult or they don't have the bandwidth in order to take that very honest feedback and then bring it back to the company and say, hey, we're hearing this. Let's let's consider this or that or let's give a special code to the people that missed out on the sale because we didn't hold up our end of the bargain. That was a very quick, maybe 10-minute meeting that could have resolved all of that. If I were there a brand member or brand representative – That would have been something easy for me to not only get tons of social sharing content from because people are going to be like, holy shit, guys, they gave me a 50% off code because they heard that I missed so-and-so. Wow. Like, not only does that as the consumer make you think like, good shit. Wow. Okay, cool. Like, yeah, those dresses are expensive. It's really neat that like you see you've created this cult like following and not everyone can get their hands on it. That little bit of effort, it would have taken someone in coding maybe three, four minutes to make the code. Like, it could have been dealt with. It could have turned into a marketing campaign that would have given them a brand new silo of people that were ready and willing to buy right then and there because they missed out. It could have been an opportunity for them to be able to build out almost a VIP tier of, you know, creators that they're working with that have this higher level marketing understanding that can help them to rectify what they've done to their customers with these oversights happens every day. So they either stick their head in the sand like an ostrich and they blame it on someone like they, I'm assuming they did with you or they use you 
And they're like, whoo, girl, thank God for you bringing this to our attention. We've been drowning in orders. We can barely keep it together. This is great success, but it's a lot on us right now. And my one marketing person can barely handle what's happening, let alone dealing with this fuck up. What do you think we should do? Right, right. And, and that using that person better way to go about it. as that trusted conduit. And I think it's, like you said, sticking their head in the sand. And I think that when the sales are coming in so hard and fast, brands get to make that choice. Do we want to approach this in a way that's going to be, help us in the future? Or like, we're selling stuff, who cares? And that seems to be more of it. I have a friend who um, has maybe like five, 6,000 followers. She's a religious Selkie fan. She spends hundreds of dollars a month. Even She's pregnant and she just bought the cutest little jumpsuit, loves them. And she had reached out to them because she shares them indiscriminately all the time, like almost every other post. And She's a creator and wanted to work with them. And they told her, you don't have enough followers for us to work with you. But then reposted her content on their feed two days later. And I was like, and she still buys their stuff. I'm like, girl, why? They just told you like, and they don't, they're not even paying you to be in their affiliate program. It's simply giving you a code and you already they, share their stuff. And that's, that's, that's what's so hard. And that's why we see things like that. Facebook groups popping up. There's one called when Selkie fixes their zippers, I will take this group down. <laughs> Oh shit! And so you have people who love the brand. I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, So I wish them the best. I still think that their dresses and designs are absolutely beautiful. They are one of the only size inclusive brands out there that Mm -hmm. creates beautiful dresses and clothing like that for Mm -hmm. people. So I just hope that they can do better in the future with their creators. It 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 will. It will happen. We'll fingers cross it, but there comes to be, uh, it's almost like the Oprah effect can make or break a business, right? So like when you're younger, but I know you've seen the Oprah holiday Christmas episodes, uh, in the very first, like we'll say five years of them doing that, they didn't realize that they needed to warn the businesses that they were working with that, all right, you got to get production in the beginning, the first few years, they were mapping out the show three months before which didn't give the business owners enough time to get back stock. As the years go on, they're reaching out to them nine months ahead of time to make sure they've got enough time to create new products. Maybe they're going to do something for Oprah specifically. Now they've got back stock for three sellouts. Three sellouts is what they recommend. But if you're not prepared for this expansion of success, that can happen from going viral or just one person like you making a hundred thousand dollars in sales for them. That's a hundred thousand dollars in sales. They didn't have coming in before you. And I wonder if they thought about having all these influencers and all these content creators and all these affiliate code members coming in and truly pushing a brand they're obsessed with. The success factor can really make or break a company. If you don't have the ability to pivot quickly. If you can't be somewhat flexible and think on the fly and always keep the customer first when it is so tempting because of the dollar signs accumulating in the bank to start taking a corporate focus and focusing on the numbers. And we're looking to get bought out by urban and like you name it, they start to cheapen and weaken the brand to where the customers can smell the blood in the water. And they've got a very short period of time to reverse it back before they're DOA and they might as well be in Macy's because no one's buying you anymore. I am so interested to hear it from your perspective in that regard, because I'd always had to deal with it on the other end, on the PR side of things and be like, guys, this is damage control. You need to do this, 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 but hearing it from your perspective, it is very, uh, it's almost like they cut off their nose to spite their face because I'm sure you weren't the only one that, receive some type of disconnection from something not going correct for them. And they just had to trim what they saw as fat rather than as like something to add to the pot that would help what they're doing. So thank you for sharing that. You can't take things personally too, whether you're a brand or a creator, like what I put out there on Instagram for me is my brand. Uh, The TikTok is a little bit more personal with what I share there because that's just kind of how TikTok works, but you can't take things personally, especially as a brand owner and you have to be open to feedback about what you're posting, what you're sharing, what products you're putting out there on both sides of the of the table. Very important. I would love to hear a little bit about your personal brand. Could you describe your personal brand for us and how over the last year, we'll say, of you 
really taking this career and running with it, have you seen it shift or refine or change? I would say so. I definitely, I had like my little cottage core era last year and kind of, it was super fun at the time, but have settled back into like my more, this is what I can actually wear out on a day-to-day basis. And so I think for me in terms of personal branding, it is like independent woman who works full time. I don't have any kids. I don't want any kids. I don't talk about that a ton online, but that's how I feel. Loves to travel and just kind of doing my own thing and being my own person in terms of being tattooed, but also being able to be very feminine at the same time. And I will be 30 in January, which is crazy. I'm going on a cruise to celebrate because that's what old people do, right? They go on cruises. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> yeah. I am very excited no, for no, my no. cruise. It's true. It's true. I'm it's very excited for my cruise. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it's just become less of trying to do what other people are doing and more of just keeping on doing what I'm doing and taking in things on a daily basis that can help me refine that and not being afraid to share vulnerable things as well too. I share a lot of pretty fun things, but I also share, like I share a lot of things about the trauma I have from my relationship with my mom. A lot of people will see that when I share that. I share a lot of um, stupid emails I get from brands and the way that they speak to people, which is always fun. And Mm -hmm. it's, um, I don't want to use the word aggressive, but a a little bit like, I'm not going to take any BS. I don't have to. I am who I am. I'm going to share what I want to share. And this is who I am. Take it or leave it. And I have strong opinions on that. Yes. As you should. It's your life. You got one life. And we kind of have the cool benefit of having these like interactive memory books that we get to kind of, especially for creative girlies, we get to really go in and just like curate our memories. I, I do love when a creator takes that aspect of things. And even though yours absolutely has uh, more of an editorial feel to it, you always come through in an authentic manner to where I'm reminded like, oh, she's a woman, you know, it's just a woman taking a gorgeous picture in a cute outfit and like, you know, her and her husband are probably going to go walk and get a nice coffee after this is done. Like you feel, uh, your content especially makes me feel like they, I think they call them like the glitter vibes. It's like, it's not a traumatizing trigger. It's like a, Ooh, trigger. Like you are very much that, uh, for me, whenever I see your content, I'm like, "Ah," like you revel in the things that a lot of people take for granted now, which, you know, there's a lot to be said about, putting on an outfit you feel your best in, doing your hair and makeup, getting out, having a new pair of shoes fresh out of the box. Like it really does do something for how you feel and it sets a tone for your day. And I literally look like a dirty gremlin almost every day of the week because I work from home. So I get that vibe for myself from your content. Mm -hmm. And I was just really excited to talk to you to help inspire other people that want to do it, but are just afraid of all the parameters, the business side of things, getting in front of the camera. Um, But you're just such a beautiful example of how this can become a very lucrative career um, while you're also doing many other things and doing so well. It can be done well. Um, As you heard, she has systems in place, programs that she enjoys, and she figured out what worked for her. And over time, it's gotten leaner and more creative and something that flows now. So uh, I hope everyone listening, you are ready to get out there and start making content, even if it's just for you. You deserve that. Everyone does. We don't need to feel badly about wanting to do it. Um, Oh, my final question that I ask every guest. Dominique, how do you make your life rich? Oh, that's a good question. I used to think that I made my life rich by buying things, to be honest with you. Like, so this is a little bit, the question will be a journey. And I loved once I was making money, buying designer things and buying nice things. And after, as I've gotten a little bit older, I'm like, do I really like that? Does that really bring me joy? And I've been able to pull out the things that have versus the things that haven't. And so for me, I think it's really Getting to know yourself and what brings someone else joy doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to bring you joy. So for me, it is 
uh, knowing that I've done the best work I possibly can at the end of the day when I sit down. That's what makes my life rich. To be able to sit down with my husband and my dogs or go on a vacation that I've worked hard for and knowing that after affirming for myself, I deserve this. I've done the work to get here and not feeling bad about the things that I have or the things that I've gained. Oh, so beautiful and so well said. It is uh, the hallmarks of a life well lived when you know that you're doing your best and you're happy with that. And everything else that comes is just icing on the cake. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much for being on the show. This was yes, great. And thank you for so sharing fun. all of your insights. Um, I just, I really love the way you do it. And I was so happy when you said that you would share all of your tips yeah. and tricks. So thank you so much. Of course. Absolutely.